am Kamiko Black Gilmore, Chief of Staff here at UMKC. On behalf of the, of the Chancellor, Molly Agarwal, the Executive Council, our students, faculty, and staff, I want to welcome you to the sixth installment of UMKC's Critical Conversations. Racism is a construct that is embedded in the fabric of our culture. Recent incidents regarding the death of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor have sparked a global movement that highlights the, this dysfunction that permeates many aspects of our lives. Regardless of race, every person is impacted by racism. However, overwhelmingly, most have not engaged the topic head on. UMKC is committed to hosting these critical conversations addressing systemic racism in the United States. The goal of each discussion will be to enlighten, to educate, and to explore the causes and potential cures for racism. Today's discussion is grounded in the relationship dynamics of white women and women of color, specifically in higher education. As leaders in the academy who identify as female, it is important for us to do the work to unpack the realities of how we engage on the basis of race. Delving into how we landed here, whether good, bad, or ugly, is necessary on all levels. We have to do the work in order to ultimately create a classroom and overall campus experience where these same topics can be examined and that knowledge applied so that we can strengthen these relationships at large between white women and women of color and move this country closer to a more perfect union for all. When this is all over, we want you to take this information with you and integrate it into your commitment for racial justice in the future. Now, I will turn this over to our moderators, our own Lana Davenport, Senior Diversity Program Coordinator with the UMKC Diver Division of Diversity and Inclusion, and our own Tamika Lage, Manager of Students Training in Academia, Health and Research. Tamika and Lana. Thank you, Kamiko. I am so excited to be here. Um, I know everybody else is excited to be here. It's going to be a wonderful day. Um, like Kamiko said, my name is Tamika Lige and I work with the STAR program. Um, and I just wanted to take a second to extend my thanks to all of our amazing panelists. Thank you for being brave, for showing up as your true authentic selves, and for leaning into vulnerability. Um, in the words of Brene Brown, um, who we all know studies vulnerability, she says, when you shut down vulnerability, you shut down opportunity. And so today, um, by allowing ourselves to be uncomfortable and lean into that vulnerability, that is where change will start. And that is where we will grow. Today is an opportunity to educate, learn and grow and to disrupt complacency and work towards building stronger relationships and lasting change. So thank you for having me and thank you all for being here. Hello everyone. My name is Lana Davenport. My pronouns are she, her and hers. And I work for within the Division of Diversity and Inclusion here at UMKC. I also wanna share my sincerest gratitudes towards uh, the folks that organized this opportunity for everyone, as well as our wonderful panelists and my co-moderator, Tamika, uh, as we engage in crucial information, crucial conversations to help us all move the bar forward for closer, um, moving closer towards justice for everybody. Thank you, Lana. All right, are we ready to dive in? So the first thing we need to do is get to know everybody. So. I could take some time and introduce you, but nobody knows themselves better than you do. So if I could have everyone take a couple of moments just to introduce themselves and then have you go ahead and answer um, this question. So we're going to answer, why are relationships between women of color and white women important? And then following up with what should, or why should institutions care about this topic? And we're gonna start with uh, Shani. Hi. I'm Shani barracks Moore. I use pronouns she, her, and hers, and I'm delighted to be with you today. Um, I have worked in diversity and inclusion in some capacity for um, about 20 years or so, and 
I see the effects of this at play, um, notably for me, speaking from the eye perspective among white women who really do want to do the work, but may seem to want credit for being involved. Um, but it's really not about the credit. It's really about the work of making policies, programs, practices, and people more inclusive, and not about, look at me, give me my gold star for caring about anti-racism and these issues. So in my view, women of color and white women really have to work in tandem and build trust in order to build these coalitions. And for me, you can't talk about equity for women without talking about the disparities between white women and women of color. And we have to begin to address this, name it and address this reality and really discuss how we can work together to, to really bridge that gap. And this involves acknowledging and affirming the experiences of women of color. I think that's the first part is not explaining away oh, well, maybe you're just making it up or, or all it's in your head. I think that really works to eat away at um, the experiences, the lived experiences and the lived truths of, uh, of women of color. And so white women have to be willing to be allies and accomplices for truly inclusive liberation. And one of the things that I often say is that Quite frankly, most of the marginalization that I've experienced has been from white women, and it makes me actually prefer working with white men um, to white women for this reason, because of the level of fragility. And, um, you know, I feel like there's always folks wanting to get a gold star for participation. It's like everybody gets a trophy for just showing up. But for me, this just this demonstrates the inequity and horizontal oppression that's often at play between women of color and white women. And the other thing personally for me is that I'm the mother of two future black women. Um, I've got two daughters who are 14 and 15 years old. I see a lot of this dynamic even happening at their age and, and that's where it starts. And, and so I think we have to kind of break that cycle. And so for the question about what makes um, interactions and relationships between women of color and white women hard or challenging, for me, in my perspective, it's the denial by white women often of their role in complicit engagement with the ongoing inequities and oppression that exist between white women and women of color, and from my perspective, most specifically black women. And it's almost like we're just supposed to take it and not show any emotion, you know, not be angry because, you know, as soon as we show emotion, then we get angry, you know, then we're labeled as angry and we'll talk about that later. But that builds up and it shows up as passion but then we're punished for it. So it's like, are we supposed to like sacrifice our souls? You know, and it's, it's kind of like, we're always talking about patriarchy, but I feel like we're unwilling to look internally at the level of dominant matriarchy that exists among our own gender. So that's really why I'm here and I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Shani. Um, let's go next to Julia. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Julia Vargas. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I um, come into higher education, into the academy um, in a very different um, way. I spent 12 years working in nonprofit organizations, um, mostly with leadership and youth development programs, but also some um, programs around uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And um, in that time, built a wonderful coalition around. And one of the members of that coalition happened to be um, someone in higher education. And, and that is my, that's how I was introduced um, to coming into this field. And, and it was a white woman who reached out and said, Julia, I think it's time for you to move from nonprofit life into higher education. And just that simple invitation to, um, to look at another opportunity to, um, for this woman to use her, um, her social capital to say, hey, here might be a, a way um, for you to do what you've always desired to do, meant so much to me and has really given me a, a different platform. Now coming into higher education, I've been able to see um, some of uh, the differences within this sector than the nonprofit sector. Um, and so some of 
what uh, Shaney had mentioned about you know, wanting credit. And, and that is something very systematic uh, within higher education. And we have to, you know, the production of knowledge and, and, and how we um, look at, you know, our publishing. Those are really important and, and receiving credit. And the way the system is set up sometimes pits us against each other. And so wanting to see how then can we utilize, you know, something very wonderful in, in our relationships to increase the, the academy instead of breaking us down um, is, is why I was very interested in coming and, and being part of this panel today. Because I think that um, as, as Tamika, as you so be beautifully said, it takes some vulner vulnerability for us to recall those um, times where we may not have been so kind to each other or we may not have been a, um, so willing to share uh, what privileges we may have um, with each other that we need to recognize those and build upon them. Thank you so much, Julia. Next up, we're gonna go to Christine. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, Dr. Christine Brent, and I am a faculty member at North Carolina State University. I am just about to finish my 31st year uh, at NC State as a faculty member in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Um, when I started at NC State, there were, I was the first African American woman in the College of Engineering, and I was the only one for about 16 years. There are a few more now. Uh, there were African men as well, uh, and there were also a, a number of women. So in my career, I've done a lot with, uh, in the realm of mentoring and coaching. Uh, I just finished a 12-year stint as Associate Dean of Faculty Advancement in the College of Engineering, in which I was responsible for reappointment, promotion, and tenure, faculty training, uh, all things having to do with faculty. Um, at the present time, I'm actually on uh, an IPA assignment at the National Science Foundation um, for broadening participation in engineering. And I have to say at this point that my comments are not representative of NSF. <laughs> they are my own comments. <laughs> um, and I think that there's a lot of things that, that have happened over the years that have uh, compelled me to be uh, an advocate for women and women of color. Uh, I think that this topic is important because as women move forward in the academy, they need to work together to achieve progress on issues associated with gender. Um, intersectionality, I know that will probably come up at some point, being at the intersection of uh, a woman and a woman of color is very interesting. And there's a lot of historical information associated with women of color uh, and white women, how they've interacted. I'm in the South. and so. Uh, the relationship during slavery was very different. Actually, the relationship in terms of voting, who got the right to vote um, when, you know, we just celebrated this, right? And African-American women were not a part of that, or women of color, excuse me, were not a part of that. And so it's really important that the institution, uh, academic institutions, understand um, that there are nuances associating, associated with dealing with both groups together. It's not a monolithic group, all right? Um, also, there are historical as, uh, elements of the group and the manner in which they have been treated by the university. When I go to my university, the majority of the women who look like me have on the same color and they come in early in the morning, like at 4.30 and leave at 2.30 because they work for maintenance um, or housekeeping. And I have a great deal of respect and those women have provided a lot of support to me over the years. But that is, you know, so the university has to, to deal with that as well. Um, it's also important to understand all of these different things so that as new initiatives are rolled out, that they can be inclusive in their voice and in their application. Um, the final thing is at the university, what I have found over the years is that the alliances that happen between women of color and white women are interesting and sometimes strained. Uh, and there are some folks who, I won't say too much <laughs> about that, I'll get myself in trouble. The point is that um, they are interesting relationships, and I think this dynamic um, is very important. And I'm passionate about this, and when I first read, I know we'll talk about Karen's book later, I'm sure, uh, Karen Dace's book about um, this alliance between women of color and white women, there were so many elements in there I said, oh, that's what was going on. Oh my goodness, that's what was happening. Um, so anyway, that's why I think it's important and why the university needs to pay close attention to it. 
Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. So already I've heard some, some commonalities in some of your responses. I heard some talk about social capital and um, alliances and just creating that um, space for inclusion and, and um, making everybody um, have a space at the table or have their voices be heard. So this is great. I'm sure this we're going to continue to build upon this as we move through um, the questions in our, our panel today. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Karen. Oh, Karen Lee Ascraft. We have two. Two Karens. Two Karens. That's way more than you need, probably. Uh, my name is Karen Ashcraft. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I am a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and my research emphasizes themes of race, gender, sexuality, and class in the context of work and organizations. It's also what uh, I teach around as well. Um, I've been in the Mountain West for about 25 years kind of pursuing this work, and before that I was from the Bay Area in Northern California, uh, East Bay, for anybody who might be out there who, for whom that means anything. <laughs> um, I think the topic we're addressing today is so important because stronger relationships between women of color and white women stand to be so transformative, not only in higher ed, but also elsewhere. But that potential remains latent. And I think that that's because the history of the relationship is so long and troubled, as others have noted. Anybody tuning into this forum uh, already knows that there are no easy or natural claims of sisterhood. Uh, sexism, for example, something we may appear to share, unfolds through racism and vice versa. So the things that we might appear to have in common aren't exactly in common and don't readily bring us together. Uh, for many women of color, sexism is intensified by racism. For many white women, sexism is softened, blunted by racism. But white women, such as myself, have historically um, ignored these differences and narcissistically assumed our own situation as some sort of generic and our own privileges as taken for granted and continue to perpetrate racism even while calling for sisterhood. So if I were to summarize that, I would just say there's a long history of white women simply not being trustworthy allies, making claims that are not backed up by action. Um, as a white woman, these are the dynamics I think I, we are called to interrupt, first and foremost by examining ruthlessly and constantly our own participation in this ongoing process, and then collaborating with others with constant humility. And I think in particular, a panel like this um, for white women means coming to terms with the particular position that we occupy as nodes of influence. I referenced Karen's earlier, that's the term that's often getting used to summarize this. How is it that middle-aged women, white women like myself, so easily wield whiteness like a reflex? How is it that we grab the incentives that heteronormativity offers us to bond with white women in power? We've got to take a hard look at how we keep reinvesting in white supremacy, even as we say otherwise, and how we can do, not just say otherwise. To the final part of this first question about why institutions should care, maybe I just come back full circle to that um, opening comment I made about the latent transformative potential of our relationships. I think if we could strengthen ties between women of color and white women, it stands to upend institutions as we know them. Higher ed, for example, is founded on racialization, colonization, gender and sexual inequities. If we use um, Isabel Wilkerson's recent terms, caste is built into the system. It's fundamental to how power works. And maintaining that depends on tension between us. So if we were able to form more loving strategic alliances that reject that scripted conflict, it could go a long way to reworking higher ed and other institutions also. Thank you so much, Karen. Well, wow, what powerful words. Um, next up, we're gonna hear from Jennifer. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you for including me in this conversation. I'm grateful to be here with the women of color and white women on this panel and with everyone in the audience. I enter this conversation as a white cisgender female faculty member at American River College, a large community college in Northern California. 
My pronouns are she, her, hers. I direct the college's Center for Teaching and Learning. Several years ago, I would not have identified myself by leading with my race. I'm like many of my white peers in that for the first four decades of my life, racial issues were all around me, but I thought they had nothing to do with me. I grew up in a city that has been named one of the most diverse in the country, but in the most important ways, family, neighborhood, high school honors classes, church, I led a segregated life. I'm the daughter of white educators and the product of many white teachers. I never questioned as a student, later as a high school teacher, later as a faculty member at a college, whether the educational system that works so well for me also worked for students of color. So by neglecting to see myself as a raced person with racist biases, I supported policies that upheld systems of advantage for white students. I'm sharing this because as a participant in this conversation, it's important for me to be honest with myself and transparent with you about who I am and where I'm coming from. This conversation is important to me because it's an act of love for myself and for every person in it. I know that through honest conversations like these, I begin to recover my own sense of humanity by examining the effects of internalized white supremacy on me, namely fear, self-deception, and broken connection with other white people and people of color. So this is why authentic relationships between women of color and white women are important and why institutions should care. Broken and inauthentic connections between women of color and white women fueled by white women's internalized superiority help white women sustain the roles they play in upholding systems of domination in higher education. And transforming these relationships are critical to realizing the liberatory power of our institutions and the effects it would have on all of us. So thank you and I'm really excited about our time together. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And now we are gonna have Karen Bass, Karen number two, round out our introductions of our panelists. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Karen Dace. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am currently the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. I uh, know a lot of folks around this screen um, in that I, I also served as the Chief Diversity Officer at UMKC. And before that, I was uh, at Associate Vice President for Diversity at the University of Utah, and I've been communication faculty member on all three campuses. In response to the question, uh, why are these relationships important? I, I'd say that one of the reasons uh, they are important is because women of color and white women make up the majority in multiple academic arenas we know that there are more women students than there are men students uh, at every university. And there are many disciplines and units and offices throughout the campus that have more women than they have men. And one might think that that would lead to more women in leadership and it has not. Uh, and so you would think that perhaps that would create uh, the need for and the creation of coalitions between women of color and white women, but it has not. Uh, those uh, coalitions are few and far apart. And, and they're apart, I think, because there is a division that exists on many campuses between women of color and white women. And it is a division that women of color know about and white women don't know about for the most part. About a year ago, uh, a, a, an acquaintance who has become a friend now, a white woman, called to say that she'd been at a conference and there had been some discussion about the problem that women of color, in particular Black women, had with white women. Uh, and she was shocked. And so she wanted me to confirm this was the case. And I said, yeah, it, it is true. It is true. She couldn't understand how could this be possible and I think that tells the story that there is a reality that there are women working in the same offices, having very different experiences. 
uh, and that there are white women who have no idea of the multiple ways that they offend, disrespect, dismiss, and harm women of color every day. Many white women ignore their own privilege in higher education. For example, the privilege of deciding whether or not to take part in this conversation. The, the, to have the privilege to opt out of a discussion about race, which is never an option for people of color. So these relationships are challenging in many ways because of the power differential and the ways in which many white women pretend that power, privilege, and race do not exist in these relationships. Thank you so much, Karen. So kind of following up on that um, first question, I have kind of a subset question um, to ask. So what interactions and relations between women of color and white women do you feel are hard or challenging? And let's just go back um, to uh, Shani. Sure. Um... Again, I just go back to, you know, my, my sister used to say this, and I love it. Denial ain't just a river in Egypt. I mean, stop denying your privilege. Stop denying your ignorance and willful oblivion. Um, stop denying that, and we'll talk about this later, just the level of frustration that women of color deal with day in, day out. I just had a conversation today that demonstrated just the, the malignant nature of white women trying to undermine the work and the success of women of color. And it's just so pervasive. And it's almost like, sometimes I feel like you know, they're standing in the middle of the room and think they're invisible. You know, it's like playing hide and go see. I can see you. <laughs> I can see what it is you're doing. And, um, but then it's like, oh no, I didn't. Yeah, you did. And you meant to. And, and so I, I, I think, you know, we're not stupid, but I think a lot of times um, I will speak from the eye perspective that I think, Folks think we're stupid and, and that, that we don't notice what's at play. So from my perspective, th that's a huge barrier. Thank you so much. Um, let's have a couple more chime in on this before we move on to our next question. Um, so I'm going to, if you don't mind, Karen Ashcraft, would you mind speaking on this real quick? Sorry to put you on the spot. No worries. It actually kind of leads into the next question um, in many respects. One of the things um, I was going to start us off on the issue of what sort of behaviors and language use from white women and gender distrust, uh, especially from women of color. And I think Shani just hit one of those on the head. A number of ways that we weaponize white femininity. And I think this was actually just mentioned in the q a i believe i might have seen a comment in there as well one kind of micro example might be expressing sort of surprise or excessive curiosity at particularly the achievements of black women like oh how did you get here um and i'll speak to some of these other behaviors as well but i just wanted that resonated with what i saw in the q a thanks Tamika. Christine. So did you want me to answer the question? The, yes, please. Okay. I saw your hand raised. Yeah, I thought you wanted to go next. So, so <laughs> the, the, the question that's in the Q&A, you want me to read that one? Yeah. Um, it seems like white women are so overly surprised when we achieve, they want to know so many details as to how we got here. Oftentimes, I'm asked where I grew up or what type of education I've received because of my proper speech. So, you know, there's two sides to this. When I think about what Jennifer said earlier about being where she grew up and what she knew, there had to be something that happened for her to get to where she's thinking. So there had to be some level of education. So there is some level of 
of information sharing that is 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 required but then it can switch if it if you have to do it all the time so what i'm hearing shani say if you if you have to do it all the time it gets very tiring so the the I think that the way this works well is there has to be some level of relationship building and trust. So once we have that conversation about that, if I answer that question, then if you really want to be in a relationship with me, then we will talk about other things besides that. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about what, you know, there, it's got to move from that. It can't just be that. Um, I, I had a, I had a, um, uh, a summit for minority women engineering faculty and you can imagine that we are a small group and we had a, a bunch of signs that were up and we had pictures and bios of all the women and we call it the hall of fame and we had this big dinner we all walked through these these pictures and, and one of my african-american uh female uh professor engineering professor friends who's an administrator now said you know chris why should why why is this a surprise i mean we got our phds what what's the big deal why should we be and so it was this kind of delicate balance between we want to celebrate ourselves and celebrate each other and see what we're doing and yay girl you got this this is great and but then there's the other side is well why would you not think i mean i got my phd in engineering why would i not be a professor why would i not be tenured so it is a it is a delicate question but if it happens all the time and that's all you're doing that is tiring and it's it's inappropriate thank you christine and I think finally, Karen Dace is going to chime in on that question for us as well. Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, in thinking about the language and the behavior that's problematic, um, it's silence and inaction. I, I think the, the, the remaining silent in the face of obvious inequities and bias and, and disparate treatment for people of color, when white folks see it, but refuse to say anything about it or do anything about it. That those are, uh, you know, things that make it impossible for trust to build. And then the other, and this is a pet peeve of mine, and that is the, when that silence is part of a meeting that we're all attending and someone makes a very inappropriate comment or assumption that is rooted in racism, or, or one of the multiple other isms, right? And I, either a couple of things happen, nothing happens, or all eyes turn to the lone person of color in the room, as if to say, that's yours, so take it, right? Uh, and no one else joins in until the meeting is over. And one by one, almost like Nicodemus going to Jesus in the nighttime, right? Folks go to the person of color in quiet to say, oh my God, did I, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe he said that. Oh, I just want you to know I heard it. And I swear if one more person does that to me, you will see the angry black woman manifest. Thank you all very much for those uh, insightful responses. Um, the, we, we do touch on this already quite a lot, but um, I wanna come back to it just to make sure that we've uh, been able to acquire everybody's responses. And that is, uh, can you describe some of the behaviors or language of white women and men that make women uh, of color uh, trust or distrust rather their white coworkers? Um, Karen Ashcraft, this was originally to you. Uh, if you have anything else to add, we'd love to hear it and, and open to everybody, of course. I, I actually had a kind of opening list that I thought I'd throw on the table and see what others think about it. And I should just give a couple of caveats, which is to say it's an inevitably incomplete list. You'll see overlap and relation. It's general, and I know as others have acknowledged, these things are regionally, contextually, relationally specific. Um, I want to focus on behaviors and language of white women, but of course some of these can be enacted by white men as well, and they have their own repertoire. <laughs> so um, I'm going to use first person voice here as well, just to acknowledge um, complicity. Uh, okay, here goes with the list, and some of this you have already heard, I think, in the examples that have come up. First, passive aggression, a kind of perma smile that feels phony 
and other surface signs of civility and politeness that make it very hard to call out evident undercurrents, such as the example that Shani gave. Number two, conflict avoidance. Number three, making my identity as a nice, good, not racist person the central issue at stake. How could you think I would do this? Number four, trying to prove my enlightenment relative to other white women. My woke ability, you might say. Somebody mentioned this in our earlier discussions as a kind of oppression Olympics. Number five, claiming or implying that I have a right to feel comfortable and safe at all times. Number six, habitual unreflective reactions of fear and defensiveness. I feel threatened by this, even as I am actually being an aggressor, an oppressor. This is a kind of gaslighting that reverses the actual power relationship that's unfolding. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, when we get to white women responses to anger or perceived anger. Seven, tacit requests to take care of me, even as I am harming you, asking you to soothe my tears, ease my fears, assure me you know I didn't mean it, so it's okay, insisting to you that my intentions matter more than the impact. Number eight, unapologetic displays of willful historical ignorance, I believe Shani mentioned that, that let me off the hook and make this moment seem just interpersonal, isolated, from systemic racism. Number nine, there's, I'm, I'm almost done, relying on people of color for education about racism and not doing my own work. Or another version, claiming I can't say anything and have to defer because I'm white and I just don't know about race. Number 10, silence and hesitation in many toxic forms. Kara just gave a beautiful example, um, uh, such as saying nothing when I don't know what to say and I'm afraid to risk myself. Another, aligning with white men and abandoning white women of color or women of color in a range of ways, subtle and overt, and maybe um, a, a one that is most painful, I think, to witness and participate in, assuming that white folks are somehow equipped with a better or more objective barometer for judging what is and is not racist, what is reasonable response, as if we're not biased, as opposed to saying, how could I possibly know what is? Why am I the judge of that? That's an opening list. Thank you so much. That is a, a fantastic list of examples that I think we've all uh, seen in a variety of ways. Um, Shani, it sounds like you'd like to uh, also share some thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to talk about the oppression Olympics um, because that's a trigger point for me when, um, particularly with white women, where it's like, you know, and, and I had a lived experience of this, and this is gonna sound very cliche, I have a white best friend, um, but I really do have a very good friend who's white and we go at it sometimes. Um, uh, but because we love each other, we can go at it. But here's the thing. If one more person says to me, oh, well, I can understand because, you know, I had that happen too. No, you didn't. Because you didn't have it happen as a black woman, <laughs> right? And, and it's the, it's, it seems like they're trying to, you know, there's that Brene Brown video that talks about empathy and it's like, you're down there in the hole, you know, I want to come down there with you too. But to Karen Dace's point, you're not, because when you had the opportunity to come down in the hole with me in the meeting, you decided to go, ooh, it looks bad down there and just leave me down there by myself. So I, I, I think that was, that's the one thing that I would say to white women that this notion of, when a, when a person of color is sharing their perspectives of oppression, marginalization, just listen. Don't come with the whole, oh, me too. No, not me too. There's not any me too in that. Um, and, and, and I've noticed that a lot of times white women will, you know, kind of get pearl clutchy, you know, and like, well, I was just trying to help. Well, just be authentic and let me have the opportunity to, to, to affirm my experience rather than you trying to minimize it with your own. Thank you very much. 
Uh, and Jennifer, it sounded like you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I just, I, when, you know, when I hear that list and some of the things that, that Shani and Karen Dace brought up, I'm always um, interested in thinking about why, right? So, you know, go back to Karen's um, example of the meeting and not speaking up in the meeting. So I think back to, you know, when have I been in those meetings and I am one of the people who, haven't, who hasn't spoken up and maybe even said something afterwards. And um, I have reflected on that, and I and I am sure that um, that that my silence at first I feel like you know um, I, I can uh, actually recall the feelings of just feeling like too nervous or something like that, and I, I know um, that that is just kind of a self defense mode, like um, just being too um, uh, worried about what people will think. So when I go a little bit deeper, um, I realize that it's really to maintain um, my the current power structure because I'm comfortable in that and I have power in that. And um, until I'm really honest with myself about that, that's that's the point when um, when when I when I start speaking up, when I know why you know exactly why I might be backing off, then I can go ahead and push myself to speak. So I just wanted to 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 bring in that because you know that 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 protect the way that white men, women protect the power they have, and then even you know, their beliefs that help them maintain the power, like belief in meritocracy, that I've earned my position, um, you know, um, and deserve um, every, you know, thing that I have, that it may not, that it's not based on any kind of racial privilege or advantage. Um, you know, those, those um, kind of invest, my investment in, in those systems is what keeps, keeps me silent. So I just wanted to kind of open that up. Thank you. And Julia, you had something that you wanted to add as well. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, the example that Karen gave about the meeting and, and being able to speak up in the meeting is, is very important, but not only when something is, is done um, to or about women of color, but also noticing who is in the meeting with us or with you. Um, if there's a meeting, um, that doesn't include people of color, women of color, that they should be around that table. How do we then help invite um, a, a larger table? And how do we invite um, those people to come in? Uh, just a quick example on that I experienced. There was a group of people meeting around um, bringing in a speaker for um, to talk about Latino issues. The meeting didn't include a Latino. And it wasn't until the end that I was invited into um, that conversation. And so I think those having people express um, and, and say, oh, maybe I need to look around to see what voices are not being added to our, our conversation is important. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we also want to notice that there is a question coming up in uh, our, our Q&A. Uh, this question is opposed to uh, Karen. I'm not quite sure which Karen, uh, so I'll, I'll let you both uh, uh, determine. Uh, but it says, how best can we intervene in these kind of moments? So I, I, if that is a question about being in the meeting and, and hearing this, I, I think there are multiple ways. I, I just thought about a moment where I was, um, I, I don't know, I, I'll say I was at the University of Utah and we got a new president who in his state of the university decided without provocation to say he didn't believe in affirmative action. and all eyes looked at me in this big room, the space we were in. And I kind of wanted to say, look, I don't, as the Associate VP for Diversity, I don't deal with affirmative action. That's another office. I'm not compliance. Um, but it would have been great if the over 150 
other university folks there, faculty mostly, had said, could you tell us more about what your problem is with affirmative action? Right. Afterwards, people said, did you feel all those eyes on you? And, and I did, right? How about you speak up? You know, I had a woman say to me once, and, and she said, I want to be an ally, a white woman. She said, I want to be an ally, but my voice gets shaky when I start to speak. And I said, that's okay. Maybe your voice is shaky because you feel passionately about something. Maybe it's important. Maybe your shaky voice will communicate to others that you have risked saying something, knowing that folks would hear your voice shake. But that silence doesn't do anybody any good. And it just maintains, right? Uh, especially when you know it's wrong, it maintains the status quo. Oh, and let me just go back and say one more thing, I'm sorry. The other thing is, I think a lot of us forget <laughs> that when this happens, it's not as if you're never gonna see these people again. You know what? Chances are you're going to have that meeting again, and maybe you will have thought about it some more and decided, here's how I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to say, you know what, something happened at the last meeting, and I really think it's important to discuss it now. You could do that too. Thank you. I think that's particularly powerful. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned that you wanted to also add something. I'll just follow up on, on what Karen said and that um, encourage white women to, to not, not try and uh, respond in the meeting in a perfect way because it won't be perfect. And um, a person of color sent this message to me very clearly when, one time when I was talking about, you know, like something about like, you know, when I'm prepared or when I, when I, when I can do this well, then I will. And they, they just cut me off right there and said, you know, you're ne you will never be perfect at this. And if you wait for that, then you will never, you will never do it. And you will never, you know, support, be here with us. So, um, so I, I just wanted to say that and that, um, you know, there's so many ways to interrupt, even if you're just feeling like something wrong is wrong, all, all that it takes is, you know, you to raise a hand and say, you know what, I'm just not feeling right about this. And then you've opened the door for other people to speak up because if you don't feel right about it, other people probably don't feel right about it either. And then Karen already, already said, ask a question. You know, ask a question about why or, or what exactly is going on here. You don't have to have the answer. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, it's that notion of speaking the truth, even if our voice shakes, right? Yeah, it's going to happen inevitably. All right. Our next question is going to be um, directed to uh, Shani. And the question is, for women of color, how has the notion of the angry woman of color um, woman impacted you professionally? Oh, anger. It's a faithful friend. Um, <laughs> I'll say, you know, I've been doing diversity. I mentioned I'm, I'm at UNT now and I've been doing diversity and inclusion in some capacity for a long time. And I'm just going to say this. I think that oftentimes I'm expected to be the happy house Negro all the time. Um, and, you know, just kind of, let's talk about white privilege and you just said something incredibly ignorant and what I really want to do is give you a piece of my mind, but I'm going to smile through it and then have my sister circle later, <laughs> you know, with other, often with other black women where it's like, I'm going to tell you what they did today. And, and, and the reality is that is the... I'll, I'll speak from the eye perspective. I am often angry because of what I see, uh, knowing that I can't really speak and address it in the way that I really want to. The way I want to, get, it gets about right here. It comes up from here and I catch it right here before it tumbles out of my mouth. And that leads to what I like to call emotional, constip emotional and psychological constipation, 
when you are constant, it's like full body Spanx. I don't know how many of y'all wear Spanx, but you know, when you get home and you, it's like, whoosh, ah, you know, it's, it, that's what it feels like. It's like full body Spanx all day, every day. And so would you want to wear double full body Spanx all day, every day? Wouldn't that be uncomfortable? And so I think that is what many folks don't realize is that we, I, I will speak from the I perspective, I am constantly censoring, calculating, um, playing out in my mind, if I say this, what will happen? Well, maybe if I say it to her after the meeting, what will happen? Will I get vilified? Will I be punished? Will I be, I mean, the answer is yes. I will be vilified, punished, all of those things. Um, but I have to sleep at night. And, um, and one of the things that I often will say is that, you know, y'all pay me to tell the truth. And if you don't want the truth, hire someone else. I, I, I mean, and it makes me wonder, quite frankly, if these institutions really do want the truth. Because if women of color were able to speak their truths, then we wouldn't be punished for doing it. I mean, it's the punishment, it's the sanctioning, it's the, the, oh, well, here she comes. So, and that brings me back full circle to that archetype of having to be the happy house Negro. And it is, again, I say, it is not from white men that I get this. White men can deal with my directness, you know, white men can deal with me just going, okay, wait, 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 let's go back to that, to that which was said. But it's, like I said, the pearl clutching and the, I, did you just call me a racist? No, but I said, you need to check your privilege and your biases. If, if you, if, if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, that's your duck. That's between you and you. But, but we're not able, I think often to just be authentic. It, I mean, case in point, I have sister locks. It took me 15 years to finally allow my hair to grow out of the root the way that it does. Because, and granted, you have to do other things to get sister locks because I was worried about, is my hair going to be seen as political? Am I gonna have to answer for why I chose to just let my hair grow out of the root as it is to make I mean, because when it's straight, you're more comfortable. And at a certain point, you just have to decide, I need to be able to be comfortable and, be, and, and to sleep at night. And if you break into white woman tears, then here's a tissue. Thank you so much. I think Christine was going to talk to us a little bit about finding our voice. I was going to say something about what you just said about the hair thing. I mean, I have a picture, a, a set of pictures that talks about me from when I first started in the university. 30 years ago to now. And the hair, I always made sure I had my hair, uh, the picture it was, it was straightened and it was curled and I was sitting very, you know, properly in front of a bookcase, you know. And um, as time went on, you know, then I had braids and then I had the natural hair, but I really was very conscious of what my hair looked like because I was in a male dominated field engineering. But anyway, and you would give me a flashback, Shani, so. Um, now I understand what was going on, but at the time it was very important for me to present a certain image when I did my official photos for the university. And at the end of the day, you know, they didn't care. They, they just didn't care. I was the one who had that issue. So anyway, I was going to answer something else, but go ahead with the next. <laughs> I just want to say real quickly, I'm not on the panel, but I just want to say how much that resonates with me because I literally did my hair so that it would be nice and straight and beautiful, you know, before I came on for the panel today. So that is really resonating with me as well in this moment. All right, I think we were going to go to, unless you wanted to still make your comment, Christine, about oh, yeah. uh, defining yeah. your voice. Sure, yeah. that's, the, I'll do that. There was a question that, um, talked about, um, do you ever, let's see, where was it? I can't find it right now, but this, it was the whole idea of how long or how much longer, how long are we gonna have to keep doing this educating people, right? And, and 
I, I, I took the question because it was related to a comment I made. I think that everybody has to define what their voice is going to be and how they're going to use it. Depends on the space that you're in. It depends on where you are in the hierarchy in the institution. I mean, some of the women that are on this call are that their job is to work, uh, you know, Shani, I'm listening to you. Your job is to work in these areas of diversity and inclusion all the time. That was not my job, right? And so I had I got to define in some different ways how I want to do that. But I would say that everybody has a right to define the who, what, where, when, and why, and how they're going to communicate on these issues. And I think that what we're talking about here is giving you an opportunity to see that different people address it and deal with it and bring different things to the table. And hopefully in the process, you'll be able to then define how you want to define how you address these issues when you're in one-on-one -on -one with a person or if you're in a group or in a team and an understanding based on a lot of what's been said and, and some of the stuff that Karen said um, about you know what happens after the meeting they come up to you and say oh I can't believe. hearing that that is is norm that that happens to a lot of people helps you to understand oh okay so now that I know that this happens to a lot of people how am I going to deal with it and what voice am I going to use am I going to say no I'm excuse me, I got to go write a paper or a proposal. I don't have time to talk to you right now. Or are you going to educate the people? Or are you going to say, well, next time you just need to speak up in the meeting like you were speaking to me now. So th that all depends on your personality too. But I want to challenge us to think about how we as an individual are going to define how we are in that space. That's one element of this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. And now Karen Bass, I think you're going to give us a little bit more on the angry woman of color. You, you know, I think it's, it, I really appreciate what Christine just said about us deciding how we want to be defined. And unfortunately, the, the stereotype of the angry black woman has taken that power away from us. Uh, it, it, I think it's really a double edged sword because as, as Shani said, sometimes we we are angry and rightfully so and you know i've i've asked more recently if you see injustice and you're not angry and you're not a person of color what's wrong with you right why aren't you angry too but the problem is when we ask a question or or when we advocate for ourselves or for another person of color that we get labeled as angry and that gets used against us. It is used to silence us. It's used to put us back in our place. It gives white people an excuse to dismiss and disregard anything and everything that we've said. We become over emotional. So whatever you just said, I don't have to pay attention to because you're just an angry black woman. And it is such an easy, and racist stereotype to pick up that all someone has to do is say, oh, she's angry and everybody knows. No more discussion is needed, you know? And, and so if we look at, uh, you know, I would su I suspect that there's not a black woman on this call uh, who hasn't been called angry. I suspect that everybody watching this, if you are a woman of color, you've been called angry, right? Uh, and, and you know else, who else has been called angry? Michelle Obama was called angry in the 2008 election. And most recently, Kamala Harris has been described as angry. And it was easy to do because it's, it's, it's out there. Uh, you know, I love what Brittany Cooper, uh, who's a black feminist at Rutgers, says about this, this angry, in particular, the angry black woman trope. And she says, if you don't grant us a degree of emotional complexity, then you don't have to take us seriously as leaders or as a constituency that has value. White supremacy is lazy and unoriginal, and it doesn't feel the need to ascribe humanity to black women. And that's what that stereotype does to us. Thank you. This is, uh, this is important and refreshing to hear. Thank you all. Um, our next question goes to Jennifer 
uh, and it says, there's a lot of discussion about women of color uh, and uh, being angry lately, as we already talked about. Uh, for the white women on the panel, um, have you ever found a woman of color to be angry? Uh, if so, uh, has that belief limited your interactions? Yeah, so thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'll start this off and then maybe Karen Ashcraft might, might have more to add. Um, I, this question, as I kept thinking about it, became two different questions for me. One, have I seen women of color as angry? And two, have I used the racist stereotype that women of color, particularly black women, are angry? And the answer to both the questions are, is yes. So yes, I have seen women of color angry, Latinx women, Asian American women, black women of color, and it hasn't limited my interactions um, in these instances. Instead, I've been able to better understand injustices and like Karen referred to earlier, early, get angry myself or find anger, my anger. I've been able to be more empathetic and it also has you know, really helped me um, understand direction for my action. On the other hand, I have used the racist stereotype that women of color, particularly black women, are angry. And in, in, in the instances that I really tried to reflect and think back on with specific people, sometimes there was no anger and sometimes, um, that, and I was just perceiving it, and sometimes there may have been anger. But in both instances, the results were, were the same in that it did interrupt or interfere with my interactions in that um, when I responded uh, to black women in that way, um, I failed to form relationship. So, or I delayed relationship. So I'll just give two examples that I, I think in the normal like daily course of things seem minor. Um, but they have big consequences. For example, you know, I can think of uh, black women students who may have to me appeared disengaged and I put on those students that, that they were angry. And so instead of reaching out, um, forming relationship, asking what's going on, um, how are you doing? Um, I just, in, I, I communicated in, in the way, the standard ways of communication that are sanctioned by the institution. Uh, grades up on, ca on campus, the learning you know, management system, um, just communicating in, in um, really systematic ways. Um, uh, a, in terms of um, a particular black colleague who I'm thinking about, who I um, saw as angry and maybe was afraid that they were angry at me, instead of um, I had a decision to make, instead of uh, reaching out for her input in that decision, something that would affect her, I made the decision and sent it to her via email. So both of those things that I did were perfectly um, allowable within my position. Uh, they would have been supported by the institution if anyone was you know, looking. Um, and what they both did is they maintained um, the power that I held in those relationships. If I had done something different, if I had sought relationship, if I had reached out, that would have been a step towards transforming um, the power dynamic between us. And, you know, like I said, they seem like very small things, but those small things add up. And when um, the power, you know, dynamics and system as is as they are, I'm re I reinforce that and they have bigger consequences. Um, I'll just, I'll leave it there. Thank you. And uh, Karen Ashcraft, I know that you wanted to also add. Yeah, well, first, just thank you for those nuanced and vulnerable examples, Jennifer. And one of the things I noticed that resonates with me as well is the reliance on kind of bureaucratic or official answers in a way that you might not do the same with white folks. You might reach out for the relationship, right? So that contrast is really striking. And of course, um, like Jennifer, this response, this judgment has flashed through me as well. I want to note that um, norms of professionalism in most organizations, but certainly in higher ed as well, the particular kind of comport that we're supposed to have 
is shot through with whiteness. Many people talk about it being gendered, but of course it's just thoroughly white as well. This kind of stiff, controlled emotionality, this tight embodiment and composure that we're supposed to exhibit. And feminists have critiqued this sort of emotional regulation of women without always calling out the racialized component of that, which I think we're really zooming in on in these um, last couple questions. Just a couple of things in terms of some of the q and A's asked about ways of intervening in the moment. And I think a lot of that work for white women is, is self-work and self-work without being self-absorbed, if that makes sense. Um, what I mean by that is that you can, you know, as sort of reflexes arise, we can really notice and name for ourselves, there I go again, there it is again. And before jumping to guilt, recognize it as this is just a destructive knee jerk programmed into me, but it's also my problem. It's not her problem, not the woman who's expressing her feeling. Um, and I can redirect my body and like work on this. Like, like Karen Day said, meeting after meeting, you have plenty of opportunities. Work on relaxing, listening, taking it, taking it in seeing how I am implicated in this and what that means for my practice, how I can do better, how I can speak up the next time uh, the angry woman of color trope, angry black woman in particular trope emerges in a room. Uh, it's not detached from me. I am implicated in this. Thank you so much, Karen. The next question is going to be directed to Karen Dace and it is, what is it about white women, discussions of race and tears? For white women, can you discuss the meaning and impact of a white woman crying during a meeting? And for women of color, women, can you do the same? And then how has that impact of a white woman crying, um, or what has been the impact of a white woman crying during a meeting in your experience? Yeah, I think that the tears shed by white women in meetings is a, probably in the top five of most problematic experiences for women of color, at least for me. So the common scenario is we're in a meeting and a white woman has maybe made a presentation and the woman of color raises her hand and asks a question and she might say, how does this new procedure impact black and brown students on our campus? Or, hmm, I thought our charge for this search was to be sure we identified a pool of diverse candidates and to be sure that we bring some diverse candidates to campus. What happened? Were there no diverse candidates? What happened? And a white woman cries. That is the response. Now, I'm not mad at anybody for crying, and I want to make that clear. I am mad about what happens as a result of those tears, and that is the discussion ends. My question, our questions, don't get answered, and instead, all of the attention and all of the energy in the room is now turned toward consoling this poor white woman who cried because she was asked a question. And the glares then are turned to the woman of color who now becomes known as that person who made Becky cry. It is made worse when often women of color are then told you need to apologize to Becky, right? And I, there are stories of women who've been forced to apologize for doing their job for asking a question at a university. So, so that's the problem. And, you know, I, I think the other problem is that uh, it works, right? It, it, you know, whether it's intentional or not, it, it helps us not to discuss whatever that issue is. And it's okay, right? It is okay for white women to cry, but it is never okay for women of color to cry so that we know that, well, it's, it's pretty rare for a woman, of, a woman of color to cry at work anyway. Uh, and that's not because we have this superpower 
for pain and racism, we can somehow deal with this, you know, it, it's not because of that, but it's because, at least I'll say for me, I would never give that power to someone uh, who has worked really hard to undermine me. And our tears aren't for the same reason. You know, our ten tears tend to be out of frustration, uh, out of shock that in whatever year we're in, this stuff is still happening at a university. Um, and it's despair. It's how did we get to this place? How did I get to a place where I've worked so hard and I've got all this education and now you dare to do whatever it is to conspire against me, to 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 work to undermine me and you're we're all supposed to be these superior folks right yeah. when i went to grad school i don't know why i thought this is going to be great because i'm going to be around people who don't suffer from any of the isms because they got all this education they're not going to be racist they're not going to be sexist they're not going to be heterosexist they're not going to be classist and guess what they're all of those things and more right and that's where, for many women of color, the tears come. But when they come for women of color, they are viewed by many white people as manipulative. Uh, white women have defined them as playing the race card, right? Uh, as trying to get sympathy because you happen to be a person of color when it is the white women who get the sympathy, right? Um, my, I, you know, I, I think if, if anything is true about tears in the workplace, um, it is that they are not created equal and white women get to do it. Women of color don't do it. Uh, when they do do it, they get punished for it. Uh, and it is clear to me if a race card is being played. Uh, it's a game that women of color can't win, that the trump card is always in the white woman's hand, right? And for you bid whist players, that means that big jack is always going to be dealt to a white woman. Thank you, Karen. Um, Christine, you wanted to chime in on the tears question? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because when I first read the chapter in Karen's book that talked about it was, I think it's called, what am I going to do with all these tears, right? And, and what she just described, I don't know if I've ever been in a meeting where somebody actually cried, okay? So I want to peel back on that a little bit because it's not just the physical tears that we're talking about. It's the action of, oh, poor me. So when she said that and I read that chapter, I thought, yeah, that's happened, not real tears. So I want everybody to, to recognize that when she says, what am I gonna do with all these tears? Not just this physical manifestation of crying and you need tissue, it's a, it's a, it's a posture that happens during the conversation that, um, and, and once you start to recognize it, uh, then you can address it, so. Thank you, that's such an important point. Uh, Shani, I think you had one more thing to add. Yeah, just really quickly, I think, you know, when we start talking about where this comes from, that it's helpful to look at the historical context, you know, and, you know, just throwing out some names, Emmett Till, um, I'll just leave it there, at Emmett Till, that, you know, it, it just takes a white woman to say that they are feeling threatened or offended or, and, 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 and I, it's not hyperbole, you know, to, to mention Emmett Till. This is still happening. This is still happening that a white woman's tears can bring down an entire people. And even if you think about some of the historical perspectives, like in 12 Years a Slave and and you know, I, I go back to my my um, my relationship with with my dear friend, and this was the first time that she and I had ever had a converse, our first conversation about race, and it was the, but what about the white woman who had to deal with, you know, her husband going out and being with that, being with he was raping her, <laughs> right? And so where where do we get 
the opportunity to feel, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying about that emotional and psychological constipation that, you know, that we are not allowed to be regular. <laughs> you know, the, I mean, yeah, sorry, I have probably TMI, I have IBS, so I have a whole lot of, um, <laughs> whole lot of uh, uh, parallels to this, but, but we're not allowed to have the same fear. Like what if we started having the same fear of white, white men that historically raped us for eons as, um, as, as white women have of any of us? I mean, what would that look like? And I'll, it's rhetorical, I'll just leave that there. Thank you both for powerful messages and also powerful metaphors. Um, the next question uh, comes to Christine. And it is for women of, or sorry, for the women of color, what is, what is it that you would like to like or need from white women in order to improve your interactions? So that's a really good question. I'm going to jump, jump back to something Shani said as, and use that as a segue into answer to this question. You know, when you think about what would happen back in the day when people were distressed in, in the traditional, I want to say slave master relationship, I think that uh, women of color uh, let's just talk about African-American women, right? This is the perspective I'm gonna give you, were there to console. They were there to help. They were there to make it better. Let me get you a cup of tea, let me, you know. And I think that in, in a lot of instances that has, historically that's happened. However, now we're in the academy as quote unquote equals, right? We're working together as quote unquote equals. And I have to believe that some element of what we, the relationships we had in the past kind of colors how we interact with, with people now. So in answer to the question, um, what do you need or like from white women in order to improve your interactions? Um, a couple of my colleagues chimed in and I'll give you my answer and then theirs. I, I think they have an authentic, transparent dialogue to work towards a, an interactive relationship that supports both parties. Um, it has to be based on trust. I mentioned that earlier. The most important concept is to not make ex, um, assumptions based on external appearance or brief conversations that you may have had with people. You know, don't assume you know someone just because you've had some conversations with them. Somebody in the question said something about, I have some women of color friends that they don't seem to be angry. Do you think that they're, 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 they're kind of keeping that under wraps? It's possible, it's very possible, or it's possible that the relationship you have with them just doesn't allow them to be totally transparent. Um, you know, having girls night out, when, all my African-American women friends, you know, back in the day was, oh girl, just like someone else said, oh girl, and then this happened. Yeah, that happened to me too, oh my goodness. So we, we have a, a, a mechanism to, to vent as well. Um, somebody else said, demonstrate that you're willing to use some of your social and political capital on our behalf. And I'll add to that, you don't always have to get credit. I think that the best allies I've had have been, some of the best allies I've had have been white men who did not need everybody to know that they did something to help me. They were just doing it because it was the right thing to do and I, the, the situation presented itself. Um, and then the other thing is to have genuine trust in our lived experiences, not dismissive of our experiences because it hasn't been true for you. So, you know, don't believe everything, don't, when they say don't believe the hype, don't believe, don't believe everything you see on TV, don't believe everything you read. Uh, everybody's experience is different and the way they want to interact and manage that is going to be different. But I think trust, authenticity, and, and, and a genuine need to have a, a relationship. And if you have to preface it, like Jennifer was saying, with, I, I really don't know, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I need to ask you this question. And, and that kind of trust back and forth, it's a delicate dance and, and it may only be able to happen for 15 minutes at a time. <laughs> Right? Uh, you may have to limit that and then go out and have some coffee or something and talk about, I don't know, the World Series or something, right? So, um, but you, you get to define that. I think that's what I want to keep coming back to. Thank you, Christine. Okay, our next question is going to go oh, to Jennifer. Sorry. It actually Wait, looks sorry. like Julia is ready to follow oh, up. Oh, so uh, sorry. No, no, I missed no. that. I'm sorry, I was a little slow. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I just wanted to um, follow up on that, what we, some of the things that um, is needed 
to really build that authentic relationship. Um, and I think both Jennifer and Karen had addressed this earlier, is, is the recognition of, of your own position. And so, and um, I say that because oftentimes we're presented um, I kind of the stereotype, stereotyped view of ourselves. And so um, by, if you recognize, oh, wait, maybe not all uh, Latinas speak Spanish, then uh, you wouldn't come to me when you needed something translated or you know, whatever those, um, those stereotypes are. And so um, a, a recognition of that is, is nice. It's also nice, you know, to ask, Ask, you know, Julia, do you speak Spanish? Or where is, you know, even where is your family from? And that's a very different question than where are you from? Uh, taking on the, the, we know you're not from here, but what's your heritage? Who, where is your family from? T to get to know, uh, um, know us better so that we can we can share our experiences. We can talk about um, how our lives intersect, how we have commonality, um, and and build that trust in. But when we start operating out of here's what I think I know about you, um, that becomes problematic. Thank you, Julia. All right, now for the next question. This is for Jennifer. Um, and the question is for the white women, what is it that you would like or need from women of color, women, and other women of color in order to improve your interactions? Yeah, um, you know, my answer to this question starts with, with a really brief story about um, some an instance a few years ago when I was in a situation where a wo woman of color asked me and a group of white people um, what, what we needed from them, um, you know, to, to, um, to, to do this kind of personal, to do some personal work. And um, I didn't, I and that group did not answer her. Um, we rationalized that we shouldn't answer her um, because people of color, we should not expect um, people of color to do any work on our behalf. And what we missed in that question was she was not asking us what work we wanted them to do. She was asking us what we needed from them on a human personal level. And the way I saw that question was a very white supremacist way to see the question. And it was my internalized white supremacy that kept me from seeing it. And then also, um, in order for me to answer that, what do I need on a human level, I also ha have to be vulnerable to people of color and with people of color. And so, so that point, I'm gonna come back to that point, but that's where I enter this question. and. I, I am in relationship with women of color today, um, and I, uh, there are many things that I need from them and that they give me. Um, I'm thinking particularly of my friends Pam Chow and Tanika Bird um, and other uh, friends and colleagues of color. And um, what, what I need from them in order to have a good relationship and good interactions and improve my interactions with women of color um, are they give me have high expectations uh, and faith that I can and will do my own work on myself. They give me the grace that kind of unmerited compassion, which gives me the space and hope that um, I will do do my work and our relationships will progress. They give me love and um, they also model for me uh, what um, it means to work with students of color from a strength lens, not a deficit lens. And I also, um, they, they give me leadership in um, our work for, in work for equity and inclusion. And I, I just wanna end, um, that's really not the end of my answer, but I shared my response with, um, with my uh, friend Pam Chow and she noticed 
that that list started on the human level and moved to the work level. The leadership, the modeling, that's work. And I just wanted to point that out. I just want to kind of be metacognitive about this because it's an example that shows how strong my whiteness is and how and why um, it just is, I am always going to have to work on it. And um, I just want to end by, um, by, by saying another thing that she pointed out about, about that list was what was not on it. Um, but what um, I, I deeply need and what she and others give to me um, in order to you know, grow my interactions with women of color is friendship. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was so powerful and just pulled out all my, my heartstrings. Um, Karen Ashcraft, would you wanna chime in on this one as well for us? Sure, I can. Um, this is a very difficult question for me for some of the same reasons that um, Jennifer outlined there, but also how close it is to the conversation we just had about tears and white women's tears. And I actually see these questions as related and my struggle to answer it as related. It strikes me that one of the most important things for white women to do is not to ask women of color to take care of us. And that was embodied in that tears conversation. And it's so easy to slip into that kind of troubling expectation for that relation, that narcissistic expectation, especially when the question is framed like interpersonally, like what does each want from the other? So I wondered if it might help, it helps me anyway, to frame this question historically. And when we think about it that way, it's not right nor really possible for me as a white woman to say, well, I'd like or I'd need uh, you to trust me, to believe that I'm genuine and active in this effort, because why would you and how could you? Um, there's such a long train of evidence that says you shouldn't. And yet, um, if I were to try and answer this question as authentically as I can, I would say, for real change to take hold, I can only rely on what Jennifer just described as unmerited compassion. I can only ask for the capacity to withhold judgment and remain open just long enough to see if I, we mean it, if I can back it up with action to receive and return the possibility that that opens up between us and to see what happens next. So I guess maybe for me it would be um, understanding that uh, I guess I would ask not to be a book immediately judged by its cover even as I get why you would know it is not my historical right to ask and that I'll never quite deserve otherwise. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to add um, to that question? If not, I will go to Julia next for what can be done to improve relationships between women of color and white women? Yes. So as I look at this um, question, the first thing that came to my mind, especially as we're looking at um, within the institution of higher education um, is, is what are some of the things that institutions uh, may be able to do um, to help foster um, these relationships. Um, and so, um, you know, this higher education is, is uh, an institution that women haven't always been welcomed into. I know on my campus, we just, um, celebrated 50 years of women on campus. Um, the campus is, is much older than that. And so there are, you know, the, the structures that were in place that we came into. And so to really look at those structures that reinforce um, some of the individualism or uh, even those structures that, um, dis that disrupt, disrupt collaboration that don't allow us to come together. I think those are some of the things that um, 
we really need to consider how can we, uh, as women in the, in the academy, look at building collaboration, building those, uh, reinventing some of our structures uh, of, of power and um, within the, the system. And then I also look at it as more personal. Um, how are we willing to make ourselves vulnerable to share those experiences with one another, um, to ask um, for support, for, um, for understanding, and how do we really look at building those, those bridges between uh, women of color and white women? Because whenever I'm in those situations where I'm viewed as the angry person, the um, in, in our question and answer, somebody said that 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 fiery Latina, you know, when I'm viewed as that, sometimes I intentionally take a step back, and then turn to my um, my colleagues, my other uh, women of color friends who I know understand this image, and just say, okay. Let me talk this through, or let let me. Um, I'm I'm drafting an email. Can you read it to make sure it's okay for me to send? But I have them filter what I do, um, building relationships so that I can I can talk freely um, with my my white colleagues and my white friends. And how do how do we build that? So can I go ahead and jump in on this yes, one? Great. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So um, thank you, Julia. That was that was there was something that you said that I wanted to pick up on, which is, you know, we're talking about systemic and structural change here at our at our institutions. And I I often just as a diversity and inclusion practitioner invite people to consider what I like to call the four P's, if, if you're really trying to facilitate institutional and structural change, and that's change through policies, programs, practices, and people. And, you know, as people are asking, what is it that you can do? I think if you're standing, so one of two things, there's the standing side by side, and then there's the taking the lead, right? And I think in some cases, white women can take the lead. And, and I'll give you an example. At our own institution, we have a, a program actually based on Karen Dace's book, Unlikely Allies in the Academy, Women of Color and White Women in Conversation. Shameless plug for Karen's book, um, but it's fabulous. Um, I, already, I, I already put it in the chat in an answer to a question too. So. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Back, yeah. And so we do, you know, intra-group and inter-group discussions among women of color and white women. And, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, is, you know, what can you do? Like, once you leave the series, what are you going to do when you leave out of here? Well, our white women basically organized um, and wrote letters to the president. And that is actually how we were able to get another um, position, another position for our office in the middle of a hiring freeze. I mean, so this stuff actually works, you know, using your voice to facilitate systemic change through those policies, programs, practices, and people. And, and here's the other thing about, you know, and, and standing beside. There are going to be times where your role as a white woman is to clear the path for, it's like, oh, okay, I want to be at this meeting, psych, it's actually her <laughs> who's going to be doing the talking, right? And, and, and I think just simple things, there's an orchard, there are orchards of low hanging fruit <laughs> of things that you can do to begin making a difference, but it's a will issue. You, you know, you have to be willing to not only do it, but also to suffer, because there will be suffering. You will be lumped in oftentimes with women of color as angry, feisty, you know, whiny, complainy. You know, there will be a, a negative adjective put in front of your name 
as is the case with women of color who do this if we decide to speak up and say anything. Be prepared for that, but do it anyway. Because the reality is that is going to, that I think for, and I'll speak from the eye perspective here, in the doing it anyway without the recognition and leading the charge so that there is space for women of color to be seen and heard and to be authentic and to be able to be authentic in that space speaks volumes and it changes our institutions. I've seen it change our institutions. So I just want to say a public thank you to Karen Days for her book because that is really what facilitated um, a lot of um, this movement that's happening at our institution of white women finally speaking up and using their voice and wielding their power. Thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, you had a follow up. Yeah, just a quick thought after um, Shani, what, Shani, what you said about, um, you know, white women using, using their voice, even though it will, it may cost, right? And I just want to add into that, that white women need to, to know, to know why they're, why they're doing it and really understand that they're, they're doing it for themselves as well. That when, you know, you, you take action that's going to lead uh, to racial justice, it's going to be good for everyone. And um, by holding up the system that exists, that system is also tearing you down inside. And in order to, uh, to, to work towards wholeness, um, that, that you need to be doing, it, doing this work for yourself, um, not, not just for others. You really need to know why. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question I'm going to ask is actually from the Q&A from the audience. And before I actually ask it, we have roughly 25 minutes left. Um, and so if there are questions from the audience, please keep feeding those to the Q&A and we will do our best to get all of your questions answered. Um, so this question um, is, as a white Jewish, Jewish person, or Jewish woman, excuse me, I have felt that we sometimes exist in a space that's in between being white and being a person of color. Of course, by no means do white Jews count as people of color, but historically in the United States, they were not seen as truly white either. For example, experiencing discrimination and refused entry into certain positions in communities. How would you recommend leveraging these experiences towards being an ally to women of color's experiences rather than inappropriately and inadvertently um, equivocating or minimizing those experiences? So I'm just putting that out there in the atmosphere and whoever feels comfortable to respond to it, um, go ahead and chime in. All right, it's Shani again. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully y'all don't get tired of me. So I thought I'd take this one because number one, I come from a very multicultural family. Um, my mother was an immigrant. Um, uh, lots, I've actually, I have a former brother-in-law who's Jewish. Um, um, and, and this makes me think of, the notion of oppression Olympics. And I think there's a really fine line between connecting and competing, you know, um, connecting with that experience of marginalization, um, but using it to be an accomplice, moving beyond allyship to accomplish it. Um, I, I think you know, just as a diversity and inclusion practitioner, one of the things that I do from learning and development perspective in our trainings is, you know, really invite people, for example, when we're talking about microaggressions, invite people to go back to a time where they were on the receiving end of microaggressions. And, and I think that humanizes it for themselves first and then allows folks to think about, um, oh, well, then I might be doing that to my students or my colleagues. Um, 
I think being able to connect to our own experiences of oppression and owning that for ourselves without comparing, just act on it, just act and don't compare. I, I, I think if, if more of us would think about our relative privileges and the, the ways, because all of us have relative privilege, right? Like I, I would argue that all of us that are on this panel are, are you know, pretty well educated women that, that have, you know, a lot more relative privilege than, than other folks, right? If we could just begin to use our relative privilege as accomplices for each other. Um, and again, I go back to without the credit, because I think that is the part that muddies the waters when it's, you know, leveraging, you know, when you talk about leveraging these experiences rather than inappropriately and inadvertently equivocating or minimizing, the moment you go into, look at me, but I did this, look at me, look at me, look at me, you're by default minimizing. Because I'll just speak from the eye perspective, it makes me wonder, are you just doing this to get some props and to get your woke points? Or are you doing it because you realize that your liberation is tied up in mine and that if I'm oppressed, then you're oppressed. And we can't get to the point that we, where we are sisters in equity and justice until folks begin to acknowledge their relative privilege. So Shani, I have a question for you. So how do you go from that to being an advocate for in a different space, right? So when that person then goes into a different space because an advocate for either you or this issue they have to bring attention to themselves, right? So can you talk about the, cause, cause th there's a, I don't know if there's a transition that happens or if it's an attitude or if it, but there, but there is a difference, right? Because once you go into that space, everybody's going to know that you're doing that. So can you, yeah. I'm not sure I, can you. So if, if a person takes that relationship and that interaction with you, and then as an ally decides to move forward with some type of action, either oh. on your behalf or on behalf of the cause, then they're gonna be bringing attention to themselves, right? So can you talk about the, the, the nuance, kind of where they cross the line and where it's not appropriate? Yeah, well, and I can only speak from my perspective for me, you right. know, I always appreciate accomplishment and I feel like there's a continuum, you know, of allyship, advocacy and accomplishment. For me, that's what the, the continuum is. Allyship is, okay, I get it. I re pardon me? What was the last thing you said? Accomplishment. Being an accomplice. Oh, I've never heard that word before. Mm -hmm. okay, hold mm -hmm. on, I write that down. It, 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 it came out of the indigenous community. Yeah, accomplishment. Um, so, and accomplishment is where you are spending your social and political capital on other people without any expectation of return on that investment. And, and for me, it is the, there's no expectation of return on that investment for you. It, in some, it's, it's, it's almost, if you're looking at it from the perspective of capital, it's, it's philanthropic. It, it's social responsibility. It's, it's, it's less philanthropic. It's more social responsibility. If we are not all, this is just my thought, if we are not doing something with our relative privilege, we're hoarding it. We're hoarding it. And, 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 and so I think we all should ask ourselves, what places and spaces are we in where we can spend some of that social and political capital and, and and share some of our privilege, um, knowing that once you give it away, you may never get it back. And, and I think there's fear inherent in that because it's, it's almost when you start talking about white identity development and for many white folks, they don't think of themselves as white, they just think of themselves as not a person of color, right? So um, you may then be treated like a person of color, should you decide to step into the arena of being an accomplice with a target on your back. But I would argue that I think 
women of color would welcome you into the circle knowing that you've got that target on your back because you spent your capital for me. Okay, so I'm sorry, I gotta, ask you, I gotta ask you one more question. Does the person have to tell you when they're transitioning to these different stages along the continuum? Or, or is that where the, that's where you start to feel uncomfortable? For me, it, it, you don't have to tell me, I'll see it. Okay. It, it, it'll be visible. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you. Um, Karen Ashcraft. Yeah, that was just really powerful set of points there, Shani. Thank you. And I love this distinction between, I think you put it, was it comparing and competition? So those kinds of like analogies we can make that help us cultivate some understanding of one another versus coming into a kind of like, friction or competition about it. I think anything that staves off, to come back to the kind of Q&A question, anything that staves off defensiveness, right? That sort of white tendency to be like, no, that's not happening. That's not real. That's not what was meant, blah, blah, blah. Anything that staves that off is useful for promoting empathy, but that empathy should not, Shani, was it you who said earlier, please don't say me too. I don't know, somebody said that earlier. Empathy does not mean saying, I know exactly what you mean. I experienced just that, right? So um, taking real care with equivalencies, right? Comparison can promote understanding, but it isn't an equivalency. And as soon as it needs to be performed, as soon as it needs to receive props, credit, visibility, like a hit on my CV, you're not an accomplice, I would assume, in that um, configuration. So... It's, that's, the question really helps us, I think, think through these many layers of what alliance looks like in relationship. So thank you all for this weighing in on this. It's helpful. Thank you. Okay, well, we have a couple of more questions in the Q&A, and I think we have time to um, try and address them. So let's... Let's go with this question. So um, it says individualism was mentioned and my question relates to it. Sorry, I just lost my, here we go. Okay, um, and my question relates to it. As there are few opportunities to advance into leadership positions within organizations, how do we get white women who relate to the underrepresentation of women in leadership in general, and therefore might see their own advancement as progress, to recognize and support women of color who are far less represented and supported for leadership positions. Um, for example, accessing their social capital and whiteness for advancement. All I'll say is this is a huge problem. It is huge. I don't know what the answer is and I don't wanna say any more. I wanna hear from the experts, but this is huge. I'm gonna mute myself now. Well, and I would also add to it that um, there has to be a, a place in time where um, women of color stop only being um, um, promoted into C-suite positions if it's the diversity officer or you know one of those types of positions because we are capable of so much more than you know only being thought of for those positions. And so that's also a part of this question. To me, I saw a very interesting conversation about that very point on social media in the last few days. And it was, it was a delicate conversation because you are absolutely correct. And then there were some people who said, well, wait a minute, don't dismiss or dis diminish the people who actually do that work. So it's kind of like, okay, let's all get our positions straight. No, we're not trying to say that we don't appreciate, you know, the Karens and the Shanis and the, all the folks who do this work. Right. This is critical. However, there are other things we can also do. And I think that that exactly. is a key component of the, of the of the conversation. Exactly. But I don't think we've answered the question. I, I'm, we I'm, haven't. We've been giving people time to think on it. Well, I, I, I'll just start and we'll see, we'll see where, where I get because I'm thinking through it um, from from my point of view, right? So if I, I want to advance to a leadership position, what is going to make 
me um, look around and see women of color who uh, would be better than me in that position, especially if my institution's goal is to increase equity and um, grow you know, the, the number of women of color who are in leadership positions. And um, you know, one, one thing that, you know, the, my first thing that I come back to is the whole topic of this, of this conversation, which is about growing relationships between women of color and white women. So if we have a community um, at the institution where uh, women of color and white women are working together and sharing experiences and um, coming up with strategy together, then, um, then I am no longer an, an individual uh, seeking that administrative position. Instead, I'm a member of this community looking to further the community's goals. So I, I'll just stop there. I think it starts in relationship and community. Thank you for that. Was there anybody else who wanted to chime in on that? Well, I'll, I'll just say, if you have an organization for women on your campus, think of, I think I would challenge you to look at how many of the people in leadership positions are women of color how many of the people who are leading committees or whatever are women of color? And are you really serious about the women of color? That's a good place to start. Uh, and if the women of color feel like they need to have their own organization, that'll tell you something too. Now they need to maybe have their own space for conversations, but if they're not engaged in the organization that is having the meetings with the provost, Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that thing rise up in me, Shady. So let me, say, I'm on mute right now. <laughs> you need to ask yourself those, those questions. And Karen Bass. Yeah, and I think what it requires is for white people, men and women, to see women of, and, and men of color as co-equal and, and of able to do work that is not diversity work, right? Um, to not always and only call on them when we have a diversity committee issue, concern, problem, right? But to call on them when we have an enrollment concern, because, you know, they could contribute. So that's part of it is to start seeing uh, people of color more fully. Uh, but the other thing is maybe it's not so much about competing with as much as it is making sure you are mentoring. So I said this on another panel and I'm still in it from, oh, I'm going to forget her name now. Uh, but someone, a white man stood up in the audience uh, and he was representing this organization in Indianapolis that is working on eradicating racism. And he asked this black woman who is the CEO of this uh, great work. Anyway, she's kind of amazing. And he said, what, what can I be doing? What should I be doing? And she said, you need to be thinking about your next job and making sure the person who replaces you doesn't look like you, right? So what are you doing to make sure that the people of color in your sphere of influence are getting those opportunities, right? That they're, they're being put on the important committees, right? You are making connections for them. You are making sure when all of our budgets are better uh, and the pandemic is over that they are going to various trainings and you know, programs so that they're getting the experience that they need so that when it's time for you to step down, because you don't get to be chair forever, right? You don't get to be the department director forever. You don't get to be dean forever. You don't get to do anything forever. What are you doing to make sure that people of color are ready to step in to your role or to the role of somebody else or to leave and go somewhere else and do that work? Maybe that's one way to think about it. Thank you, Karen. And then we're going to finish off this one with Shani. So just quickly, uh, I just wanted to say it's not a zero sum game. 
period. It's not a zero sum game. By sharing your privilege, you got plenty. You're not gonna run out. So just share some of your privilege and nothing will blow up. Maybe there'll be systemic change. Shani, we need to get we need to get little cards that we can carry around and you know, give people. Here, you, you need to. It's now's the time. <laughs> Yeah, we could market that. We could say it all started here, right? <laughs> do do y'all mind if I take the the last question about vulnerability? Because this is okay. this is so. The question is: I recognize that one woman was thanked for sharing her vulnerability, but I hear a lot of vulnerability being shared. But the vulnerability of women of color is seen as a strength and expected power. I believe that women of color are considered super women, but this is not true. Most often women of color are expected to stay silent and comply. Why do you think the vulnerability of women of color is not acknowledged or ignored? Are women of color expected to be strong? Is this a problem and why? Um, I would say yes, women of color are expected to be strong. Um, I, you know, I, I, I just lost both of my parents within the last couple of years, but I remember there was a comment that my father made to me. Um, and again, I come from a multicultural family and, you know, I quite frankly was the blackest person in my immediate family. Um, it just, you know, take that for however it is you want to take it. Um, but I remember my father saying something to me um, and I think through that lens of, oh, you're, you're a strong black woman, woman, and it will stay with me for the rest of my life. He said, well, you're strong. You don't need support. And it's as if our strength is supposed to make us lonely. <laughs> you know, like just because I'm strong doesn't mean that I don't need support. And I would argue it's the strongest people who are holding it in all the time, who are trying to catch that comment right here from not coming out, from having to be the happy house Negro all the time, all of that. It's those strong people that need the most support, that need to be seen, that folks to say, I see you and I know your strength should not be a liability. It should be an invitation for people to come and support you. So, so I think it's a trope um, of and for Black women that also comes from Black men sometimes. You know, that we just supposed to be strong for everybody. Just, you know, take care of you, take care of you. I mean, at one point I had four kids under the age of 10. I don't remember much, but it was, you know, well, you're strong so you can handle it. And, and so quit thinking that, that, that women of color can handle it. Just because we're walking upright doesn't mean that we go home to, don't go home to a walker at the end of the day. So I was going to say, you know, shameless promotion, right? So I just, I wrote a book chapter in this book called Overcoming Barriers for Women of Color in STEM. And Pamela Leggett Robinson is the, is the editor. And in the chapter, I actually took 30 days off earlier this year after 30 years on the job because I wanted to really look at, you know, what was going on in my life. And I started looking at my journals and there was stuff that was in the journals, Shani, like you're saying, I couldn't even remember some of the stuff that happened to me was egregious now that I look back on it, but I don't remember it because I stuffed it down. And I also had an opportunity through some health issues to, I've had the same doctor's office for 30 years, to go and look at my health records. And I didn't realize this, but I, I went all the way back and I could see blood pressure, weight ticking up over the years. And also there were a lot of entries that say unspecified headache, unspecified pain, unspecified whatever. And I said to myself, oh, so during that time, so some of that is in that chapter, but 
some during that time period, I was like, oh my goodness. So now the next project is to take the health record and the journals and marry them together and figure out that's that's another book. I don't have time for that right now. But my point is we haven't really talked about work-life integration. We haven't talked about work-life balance. We haven't talked about well-being, but it's a thread that kind of goes through all of this. And if you look at the demographics for women and the health issues and all, and I'm in that same demographic. So it doesn't matter that I have whatever, I still have high blood pressure. I still have other issues. So anyway, that's too much information. <laughs> but my point is that that this pushing it down, it causes other issues too. And you see it manifest itself with, I believe, with women of color differently than, uh, than white women uh, in, and in the academy as well. Too much information. Can we all just get in a, a really deep breath and really like soak in all of this, all of this that has been said today? It's been pretty incredible and very, very important, vital for us all to be able to move forward. Uh, I want to just take a moment to thank everyone for joining us for our sixth Critical Conversation series event this afternoon on a dialogue among women of color and white women. I wanna give a special shout out to all of the incredible energy and amazing wisdom uh, that came from all of our panelists today who joined us from all across the nation. This was fantastic and phenomenal and deeply needed. Uh, as we can see through a lot of the responses we we're seeing from some of our, uh, panel, our, our panelists, each other, of course, and our, our participants as well. Um, and so as a reminder, uh, of the charge from the very beginning of these conversations, that this conversation cannot end here. If we really want to upend these systems and structures of racism and sexism and more, it requires us to actively choose vulnerability and for white women to let go of fragility and perfectionism uh, that only serve to uphold and silence and oppress women of color. And as white women, we must uh, recognize our mistakes and be willing to utilize our privilege to take risks in the moment and disrupt racism against our women of color colleagues and our friends and taking responsibility to address racism uh, against, uh, to address racism not only in our universities, but also in ourselves, in genuine allyship and in caring support. And acknowledging that the system of racism, as well as all isms, only serve to tear us down uh, and that our liberations, all of our liberations are wrapped up in each other's. And so we have deep commitment that must move forward. Uh, in doing so, we can all strive to build more loving, authentic, and equitable relationships while ensuring us all to have an equitable seat at the table. Thank you again for all of your time and your energy. We hope you take this home and spread the word and make moves towards this uh, more uh, just society.